to Professor Bernadette Warner. Thank you for opening up this evening's uh, proceedings to Dr. Dennis, excuse me, Professor Dennis J. Gale. I want to thank you for that very generous uh, introduction and to Dr. Winston Adams. Let me thank you as well for uh, being uh, a true friend uh, and uh, guiding light for this wonderful institution to the very distinguished faculty who are here present. It is my honor to be here with you once again. And to the scholars here at UCC, I'm so happy to be back amongst you and to just share uh, some thoughts with you this evening. Let me stop and acknowledge my parents who are the true Jamaicans The Kingstonian, Mr. Leslie Clark Sr., graduate of Excelsior. And Dr. Una S.T. Clark from the beautiful Breadbasket Parish of St. Elizabeth. Graduate of Buxton. I know you haven't heard of it. It's been phased out. And let me acknowledge a very dear friend, DeMario McDowell. Thank you for joining us here this evening as well. And uh, to everyone here gathered, it's certainly my honor and my privilege to come uh, as an alumni, uh, uh, fact, as an alumni student, to share with you uh, some thoughts uh, and some ideas most importantly. I think it's important that uh, in this time, we use the opportunity we have in this relationship to exchange information, to encourage one another, and to build bridges uh, that I believe uh, would be most appropriate for you who are scholars and who are sort of navigating your way through an educational endeavor and to open your mind to some possibilities of ways in which uh, you can use your academic acumen to be of service not only to yourselves but to the world around you as global citizens. As has been stated, I am Congresswoman Yvette D. Clark and I'm proud to represent the 9th Congressional District of New York, which is Brooklyn, New York. How many of you have relatives or friends who live in Brooklyn, New York? Raise your hands. Look at that, look at that. We're already connected, we're already connected. It is truly wonderful to be here with you again. This summer, as has been stated, I was bestowed with an honorary degree from this very institution and university. Now I'm just so proud to be kicking off the Distinguished Lecture Series for the 2018-2019 school year. If only my grandparents were alive today to see this. You see, it is my grandparents uh, that helped me uh, to shape my worldview. To be here today uh, is a testament to my parents who sought not robbery to make sure that I was well acquainted with where I, I was from and to whom I belong. And so I spent many years, starting from infancy, in the rural section of Jamaica called St. Elizabeth on a sugarcane farm where my grandfather was a sugarcane farmer who sold his sugarcane to Appleton Sugar Estate. And I had the opportunity to travel in that rural section of Jamaica. And at that time, he had the most modern technology available to man. It was a mule called Judge. <laughs> but it got the job done. 
Fast forward, we're here in the 21st century, approaching 5G technology. How many of you have mobile phones? Let me see your hands up. How many of you have more than one mobile phone? And when you turn on your phone, you'll see a little icon in the corner and it says 4G or 3G, depending on where you live and what your plan delivers. I say that to you because those devices are opening up a world of possibility. They are connecting us globally. They are enabling us to access information at the speed of light. And that access equalizes opportunities for people around the globe. It is how we maximize on it how we use our creative thinking, how we use our studies to advance humankind. And that's part of what I'd like to talk with you about in this series, in this lecture today. One of the areas that you heard uh, that I am championing is a concept called smart cities, or as I like to call it, smart communities. And this is a concept that has been taking root around the world. Um, in the United States, we have been fortunate to have uh, our cities in particular fully wired for the transformation, uh, for the uh, translation and transmission of information, as I've said, at the speed of light. We have fiber optics, which enables that same information to travel. We have cellular uh, technology, which again, connects all of us. Uh, how many of you have the application called WhatsApp? Everybody in the room. And it is through the use of the internet that we are able to call our friends, call our neighbors, call people around the world, exchange information at minimal cost to us. Just think about the technology, that platform that enables us to make those types of connections and what you could do given your studies right here at UCC to advance your own capabilities and by extension, what you can do to advance a nation. When I think about the concept of smart cities and smart communities, I think about the traffic here in Kingston. I think about the fact that while I was just right down the road, it took us about 35 minutes cutting down each little road to get here. Now think about technology. And what smart cities would enable us to do when connected properly is it would build out an infrastructure that would speak to the ability for us to efficiently travel from point A to point B. In some instances already, like in Europe, they're able to, they have embedded sensors in their roads that are connected to their traffic signals that also speak to their vehicles, which have the technology embedded in it. Imagine right here in Kingston, Jamaica, were we to deploy similar types of technologies, what it would mean in terms of productivity for the people of the city, for the workers, for the students, for all of you who are trying to make it to class on time. It's my understanding that many of the students here are also working, are employed, so time is of the essence. Time means money. Your education is important, you're paying school fees, you can't afford to get to lecture late. And traffic 
is the antithesis of being on time. And so think about it. Think about if you were to develop an app, what would that app need to tell you in order for you to get from point A to point B on time? How could you use innovation to, be, to enable you to not only provide for yourself, but for your neighbors? Ways in which they can move from point A to point B. We can, first of all, use GPS technology. We can integrate that with road sensors. That can then be integrated with the traffic signals and can also give you the, the appropriate routes for getting around road construction. All of this is already happening in different parts of the world. In the EU, they've already embedded these sensors in the roads. And so as we go through new road construction here in Kingston, wouldn't it have been uh, effective to have that technology deployed so that at the appropriate time with the appropriate connectivity, you are able to use that same device to then tell you the best route to getting where you need to be. That is what a smart city does. That is what smart te technology is all about. And each and every one of you have an opportunity to think through what would be most effective for a civil society like yours. What would create more productivity for the people of Kingston, Jamaica, and by extension, the nation? Because this is the hub. And when this hub has cre unleashed innovation, it creates opportunities for entrepreneurship because who's gonna maintain the infrastructure? You're gonna need workers, individuals who understand the use of mobile technology, of sensors, and all of the infrastructure that is required to build out the smart city. So a smart city is an urban area that uses different types of electronic data collection sensors to supply information which is used to manage assets and resources effectively. This will include data collection from citizens, devices, and assets that are processed and analyzed to monitor and manage traffic, transportation systems, power plants, water supply networks, waste management, law enforcement, information systems, schools, libraries, hospitals, and other community services, all connected. That is exciting, and that is the 21st century. And so I wanna challenge you as we go through this lecture series to think about ways in which you can envision a Kingston, an area, a space, a university campus, that enables you to unleash these types of innovative means and assets to, again, bring about efficiencies that make the difference in the way in which you work, live, and you play. The smart cities concept integrates information and communication technology, also known as ICT and various physical devices connected to the network, also known as the Internet of Things. How many of you have heard about the Internet of Things? All right, so let me tell you about it. Just about every new product that is on the market today has the electronic chips in them that enables you to manipulate them in a way in which it creates efficiencies. So in the United States, when you are at home, when you leave your home, you have your mobile device, 
you can actually set the temperature in your home, turn on air conditioning, turn on heating. You can make sure that you can communicate with a refrigerator to know what items you need to purchase when you get to a supermarket. You can actually purchase the items online on Amazon, have them delivered at the time that you'll be arriving. The Internet of Things is a way in which technology enables us to do just about everything that we have always done manually, but effectively and efficiently through the use of technology. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine that? This is what is happening already in the US. Can you imagine with the cost of energy in Jamaica that the moment that you leave a particular area, that energy downgrades and transfers to another area where that energy is required. These are all capabilities that exist today. And when you think about the nation and how you keep a consistent source of energy going, how you plug into the renewable energy movement and you move away from fossil fuels, we're gonna have battery operated vehicles. We're gonna have, and then already in testing in the US, self-driving vehicles. Imagine that. I don't know if I'm gonna use that, but it exists, it exists. And so the Internet of Things will help us to optimize the efficiency of city operations and services and connect to all of our citizens. Smart city technology allow for city officials, it could be even a campus environment, to interact directly with both community and city infrastructure and to monitor what is happening in the city and how the city is evolving. And so I'm here to, again, stimulate your thoughts around what Jamaica can do, what Kingston can do to spark this revolution. Examples of smart cities around the world, according to a report of 2015 from Forbes magazine, the five top smart cities around the world are Barcelona, which is earning a high score for environment and smart parking. New York City, earning highest scores for street lighting and smart traffic management. London, earning highest scores for technology and open data. Nice, which is earning high scores on environment and agency cohesion. And Singapore, which is earning high scores for smart traffic management and the creative use of technology. Smart communities are built on smarter energy infrastructure. One of the areas that I have been discussing with the administration in Washington, D.C., prior to the current administration that is in place under the Obama administration was assisting the Caribbean region in really uh, reinvigorating and unleashing innovation in the energy space. For too long, the region has been very dependent upon fossil fuels. And as we know, climate change is upon us. The use of, of fossil fuels has created conditions globally that are unsustainable for human life, that are making a difference in the rapid uh, change in climate that is really imperiling all of us in the Western Hemisphere and even beyond. And so now this generation has a responsibility to the generations coming behind us. And that is how do we combat, how do we combat climate change? Well, one of the things that 
this region can do, and Jamaica in particular, is harness, harness the God-given gifts of renewable energy, solar energy, hydro energy, energy that can be derived through new technologies that are clean technologies. And one of those areas that those of you who are looking at the, uh, the space of electronics or anything having to do with computer sciences is how do we capture energy, how do we contain it, how do we store it for use at a, another time, at another date. Anyone who builds out uh, battery storage for energy will be uh, heralded around the world. There are currently companies in the US and uh, around the globe that are working on that technology as we speak. But I wanted to open your minds to the fact that you can be entrepreneurs in that space. What would it look like to be able to capture energy, save it, redistribute it, and unleash it at a time when it's most needed? Because the fossil fuels we burn today, we never will see the benefit from it again. But renewable energies are energies that we can put into a system that will continue and perpetuate themselves over and over and over again. And so I want to encourage you, that is one component of how we build out 21st century smart nations, smart communities. It's looking at the idea and then moving forward with innovations to, pre to produce sustainable energy in the next uh, in the next generation. I was inspired to start the Smart Cities Caucus from my personal interactions, seeing the ama amazing build out firsthand in New York City. The Congressional Smart Cities Caucus serves as a bipartisan group of members dedicated to bringing American communities into the 21st century through innovation and technological change. And I wanted to share my observations with you in the hopes that perhaps someone here would be interested in doing something similar for Kingston, Jamaica. In the United States, we joined in partnership with our private sector partners, our uh, telecom companies, to, build, to convert old telephone booths. Do, does anyone remember the telephone booth? Gone like the dinosaur. We converted them into Wi-Fi kiosks so that whenever you're walking through the street, you can charge your phone there. You can actually download information and data there. And in communities where uh, they can't necessarily afford the service, they have access to free Wi-Fi within a certain radius. And if you know the old infrastructure of New York City, we had telephone booths throughout the city, one after another. And so our city is completely wired for free Wi-Fi. That is amazing. Young people can do their homework. They have access to this infrastructure. And imagine if you have those kiosks, what we can do in terms of managing, again, traffic flow, energy going to street lights, traffic lights, making cities safer. You know, I was uh, looking uh, from the Pegasus Hotel over at the Emancipation Park, and I saw all the lighting there. And I said, you know, people are jogging around. What if when people are leaving the park, the lights went out? conserving energy. And the moment that someone hit the track, the lights came up. That's embedding sensors into that track and knowing when there's a human presence in that space that needs to have the security of lighting around them. But it would save Kingstonians big money if those lights were adjustable in that way. 
And that's what a small example of a smart city can do. So our caucus is intended to bring lawmakers with industry stakeholders, our telecom companies in the United States, it's Verizon, it's Sprint, here it's Flow, it's Digicel, and local community leaders together to share ideas, best practices, as well as give insights to Congress on new policies. Our caucus has four pillars. One is mobility, infrastructure and transportation. A people who are mobile are a people who are industrious. When you have difficulty getting to town, it's rough. You have to take business. You may even have to sleep overnight. That's accommodation that has to take place. I remember back in the day, now I'm gonna date myself, we used to pack up food to travel to town, wake up early in the morning before the sun was up, traveling from bus station to bus station to bus station. Can you imagine an opportunity where you set up a rail system, and I understand rail is coming back to Jamaica, that is high-speed rail, that gets you across uh, the country in lightning speed. I'm gonna date myself again. I remember taking the diesel. Anybody know about the diesel? All right, there's some people who know the diesel in here. And we would land right here in Kingston and take that diesel, that thing barely moved, across this country but it was the mode of transportation of the time. Imagine being able to get from here to Negril in 45 minutes. Imagine that. The capabilities exist, and we need to be able to think through that. What would enable that? What are the policies that need to be put in place? How do we appeal to parliament? How do we appeal to the private sector to partner to make this a reality. So mobility is very, very important. You could think about so many different ways that mobility is important. It's moving goods and services, not only people, making sure that that is available. Number two, connectivity. I spoke about the Wi-Fi infrastructure that has been set up in New York. You have to have a consistent source of energy, but how would you set up a network of Wi-Fi across Kingston and then connecting parish to parish? Who would you partner with in other parts of Jamaica to make that a reality? Connectivity, the deployment of 5G technology is going to transform this world into uh, a futuristic place that enables us to really uh, show who we are, use our talents, and unleash uh, all kinds of um, productivity, as well as making sure that we have the ability to benefit in very significant ways, financially and otherwise. So, let us give some thought to that. The third part, and I talked about this a little bit, is sustainability. What makes a nation what they call a first world nation is a sustainable source of energy. If your power grid goes down and is not reliable, you're considered developing, or in the case of Jamaica, a middle income state. How do we develop for Jamaica, again, a sustainable source of energy that does not degradate the environment? That in itself is an area of entrepreneurial endeavor that so many uh, want to crack the code on. And I think that there's someone in this room who has the ability to do that. It is very important Jamaica is a paradise 
you all are very, very blessed. However, the maintenance of this nation for generations to come has, excuse me, has to come from you. Has to come from you. Because there are those who currently benefit from the status quo, but the status quo is not sustainable. Not only that, it can be dangerous. My cousins were, tell, my, excuse me, my nephews were here over the weekend and they wanted to go to the beach. So they got in a vehicle that took them to, I forget this new beach, Waves. Wave Beach, is it you know about it? I know you live here. They wanted to go to Hellshire Beach and they get there, <laughs> excuse me. they want to go in the water, but guess what's there? Seaweed, seaweed, they can't, they, they can't get in. It, it's, they, they're staying on the beach, they wanted to get in the water, but they couldn't because of the seaweed. And they said the seaweed was not smelling good. Look at what that means for an industry in a paradise that people want to visit. Who's gonna invent the technology that enables uh, a rebuilding of the reef that would typically stop the seaweed from absorbing and, 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 and taking up the area of the beach? Who is that? Think about that. That right there is a job, is a business that can employ people in, in this community. Right there, right there. Because there are people who will visit, who will wanna go to Wave Beach, who will wanna go to Hellshire, and will wanna get in the water. But you know what time of year the seaweed will invade the space. What do we do to build out a sustainable means by which that is no longer a factor and that enables the environment to remain as pristine as possible? Because the last thing we need is for someone to come up with some sort of chemical means by which to burn off, right? When people want to generate wealth, they don't care at what cost. And so what your job is to find the most healthy way of being able to maintain the paradise and create opportunities for those in the community to start a business, to be employed, and to create those opportunities. Workforce is the, fifth, the fourth pillar of our Smart Cities initiative. And the workforce is pipe, a pipeline that is created, retraining our workforce for the jobs of the 21st century. Because as quickly as this uh, innovation is happening in the United States, it's actually going to be happening in the Caribbean region. Because someone is going to see the profitability of being able to deploy all of this technology in the region to generate wealth. The idea is to make sure that it's Jamaican and that it's not someone coming from outside to provide it as a service when you can service yourselves. Not true? Absolutely, absolutely. And so I'm here to encourage you. Some of the most entrepreneurial people I've ever met, Jamaican. If there is something that needs to be developed, if there is a service that needs to be provided, the creativity and the innovation exists within each and every one of you. And so I'm here to encourage you because I see opportunity where others see crisis. And that's what the academic 
pursuit that you have today should be about how do you find solutions where other people see problems? How do you see solutions where other people see crisis? How do you work with one another, your professors and people in the private sector to test out and develop theories and actual implementation plans that will make the difference? Who do you collaborate with online who's already doing work in that space that can partner with you over WhatsApp? Think about that. Let me tell you something. There are Jamaicans in every endeavor in every part of this world. I have run into more Jamaicans in the energy sector in the United States than I would have ever imagined. Imagine if you Google an organization called Blacks in Energy and you were interested in dealing with renewable energies and you put that information out there to connect with another Caribbean person or another Jamaican, what kind of responses you would get? You have to move out of your comfort zones. It is those who take the risks, those who are inquisitive and curious that become the designers of, of, of innovation and opportunity for themselves and for others. So I wanna encourage you in that space. So here's my statement of challenges. Last year, hurricanes Harvey, Irma, and Maria severely damaged the critical infrastructure of, in the United States, including communications equipment in the areas where they made landfall. To this day, there are large sections of Puerto Rico where cell sites are still down, and that's a U.S. territory. Following calls to review how to better prepare for similar storms, a commission established by the Hurricane Recovery Task Force to adopt a coordinated and comprehensive approach to support the rebuilding of communications infrastructure and restoration of communication services. Additionally, in the U.S., wildfires have ravaged the western regions of the United States in recent months. That is degradating our uh, forestry, which is an important part of our ecosystem. These disasters have affected communities from Oregon, which is one of our states, down through California. As part of the local emergency responses, local government have used a mix of private alert systems and wireless emergency alert systems created under the WARN Act. So through the mobile device, they're able to prompt people to move, to migrate. What kind of system does this nation have when a hurricane is about to hit, when a hurricane is forming? Does something come up on your mobile device? You just watch it on television? That's what happens? Okay, so if you, electricity goes down, that's it. That's it, yes. Who's gonna invent the emergency warning system? Think about it. Think about it. All you have to do is dream, believe it can happen, connect with some of these other folks. You have people in New York, you have people in London, you have people all around the world who have access to this information. You can probably find it yourself online. Think about what a great good that would be for this nation. Knowing the direction that the storms are coming from, when they will hit, and how to ha help people to migrate to shelter situations, to think things of that nature. I know these are things you don't typically think about, but your education will enable you if you're just creative enough to see what is happening around. 
With the recent wave of hurricanes that have plagued Florida, Texas, and most recently Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands, and the continual threat of disaster with storms during these hurricane seasons, like Hurricane Michael, it is important that we have a study to examine best practices regarding the resiliency and security of communication networks in natural disasters. That in itself can be a huge project that UCC can undertake and be a service to this country. As the threat of natural disasters intensify, we must ensure that our communication networks are strong, stable, and secure. So I want to encourage you again, think through all of the dynamics. You think about your day-to-day -day activities. All it takes is one natural disaster. Ask Barbuda. Ask Dominica. And then you have to deal with issues of shelter, migration, food security, water security, sanitation. A whole civil society can be upsided by one storm. And so part of what we do now is preparation. Part of what we do now is look at what happens if a storm hits, how do we prepare before a storm hits? How do we prepare after a storm hits? How do we protect ourselves from storms to begin with? All of this can be done through exercising the mind and technology that is smart cities and smart communities. So I wanna sort of wrap up here because I wanna open up for conversation. I hope I've stimulated your thoughts a bit. I know it's not a uh, sexy uh, type of conversation. But you did hear that part of my studies was in policy uh, analysis and policy making. And part of what I do, because I'm left-handed, is I dream. Uh, there's some other lefties in the room. All right, so these are the creative people. You all need to circle around them, circle around them. The idea of innovative thinking, of thinking through scenarios in life. I know everyone is just trying to get through day to day, but it's you who I call the talented 10th, who are privileged enough to be attending an academic institution that will be the change makers in this society, should you choose to. I'm here to encourage you to do so. The same technology that I'm talking about, the same smart cities concept can help in healthcare, how you can use technology to know when someone is having a heart attack and how to deploy assets to a village or a space where healthcare is not a, a standing hospital, doesn't exist. All of this can be developed for those who are in hospitality, for those who are in healthcare, in education, smart cities, and the use of technology will catapult you among nations. I know that Jamaica has what it takes. The human resource that I see each and every day, that I interact with not only here in the nation, but that are part of your diaspora, are phenomenal in every endeavor, in every space that, the, that we see and interact with them. The type of brain power that God poured down on this nation is highly unusual. You need to maximize on it. You need to thank God for it and encourage him to help you use it because your nation is relying on you. 
to maximize and take it into the 21st century as a first world nation. Thank you so much for having me. I hope that this has opened your minds to possibilities. And I will now open up for any questions that you may have.